Good day and welcome to worship on this Reign of Christ Sunday, where we are challenged to see the presence of God in the world in and through our neighbors. Just a brief announcement that uh, if you are looking to get things decorated in the holiday spirit, you are welcome to uh, come to the church. Uh, there is a tree out on the front lawn in front of the office door uh, that we welcome people to come and decorate with biodegradable materials and things like that. Uh, ornaments that are, uh, that would be just fine for animals and things like that. So please come and take part uh, in making our grounds festive uh, for the holiday season that is coming. We will begin our time together after a moment of silence. Know that the Holy One is God. We are God's people. Worship the Holy One with gladness. Come into God's presence with singing. Enter God's gates with thanksgiving and God's courts with praise. Make a joyful noise. For God is good. God's steadfast love endures forever, and God's faithfulness to all generations. Let us worship with thanks and joy. Let us praise God in song and word and prayer. Gracious God, we long to know you better. Open us to recognize your presence, to receive you fully, and to be ready to follow your leading. Amen. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. O God of power and might, your Son shows us the way of service, and in him we inherit the riches of your grace. Give us the wisdom to know what is right and the strength to serve the world we have made. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. 
Amen. The first lesson of the day is a reading from Ezekiel. For thus says the Lord God, I myself will search for my sheep and will seek them out. As shepherds seek out their flocks when they are among their scattered sheep, so I will s seek out my sheep. I will rescue them from all places to which they have been scattered on the day of clouds and thick darkness. I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and will bring them into their own land. And I will feed them on the mountain of Israel by the water course and in all inhabited parts of the land. I will feed them with good pasture and the mountain heights of Israel shall be their pasture. There they shall lie down in good grazing land and they shall feed on the rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep and I will make them lie down, says Lord God. I will seek the lost, I will bring back the strayed, and I will bind up the injured, and I will strengthen the weak, but the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed, I will feed them with justice. Here ends the lesson. The second lesson this morning is a reading from Ephesians. I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all saints. And for this reason, I do not cease to give thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know God, so that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is hope to which you are called. What are the riches of the glorious inheritance among the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of power for us who believe according to the works of God's great power? God put this power to work in Christ 
when God raised him up from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority, in power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And God has put all things under his feet and has made Christ the head over all things for the church, which is his body, the fullness of God, who fills all in all. Here endeth the second lesson. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come you that are blessed by my Father, Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? When was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, You that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not give me clothing. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they will also answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, Truly I tell you, Just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. I've been thinking lately about God, well, I guess it's what I do. Uh, What I mean is that I've been thinking about the language that we use for God, uh, what we mean when we use that term, God, what it means to know God. The reason for these ponderings is twofold. I I recently came across a social media post from a friend uh, who is an atheist. He was exploring a political topic when someone chimed in with a religious response, invoking the name God. When my friend shared that he did not subscribe to there being a God, this other person started rattling off reasons why there there has to be one, things like the universe and the systems of the body that couldn't possibly have come to be as they are without some divine direction. My friend astutely pointed out that this argument, which Bonhoeffer called the God of the gaps, is just throwing hands up in the air and saying that any gap in our knowledge necessitates inserting God into it as the reason or cause. He pointed out 
rightly that there are scientific explanations to these things and we do not need God to explain them. And when there are holes in what we do know, it does not make any sense to attribute our lack of knowledge to some, his words, magical being to explain it. I've been tossing those words magical being around in my mind since I read them. Is that who God is to us? An easy out to explain the unexplainable. A God of the gaps. Is God nothing more than a cosmic vending machine in the sky where we put the right prayer or or sacrifice or belief into the slot and out pops something good? Is God the premier magician of the universe, a, a supernatural miracle maker capable of doing all the things human beings are not capable of doing? When we gather for worship, for prayer and song, when we hear stories and are sent to serve, are we engaged in magical thinking, addressing a a magical being able to fulfill our fantasies, clinging to an explanation for all the things that we find unexplainable? And then, in putting the youngest daughter to bed at night, We open up her children's Bible, and upon hearing the story, she confesses that she's never seen God. And when I try to find the words to say that she has, all I seem to have at my disposal are concepts and experiences that sound downright magical. On this Reign of Christ Sunday, we encounter a story of judgment. But not only that, I think it gives us with a way to understand who or what God might be that is mystical, perhaps, but not necessarily magical. Jesus taps into the apocalyptic tradition, which understands that a day of justice and renewal is coming, ushered in by someone called the Son of Man. In this episode, the nations are brought before the judgment throne, and and they are sorted like a shepherd sorts sheep and goats. The king welcomes those labeled as sheep into the kingdom because when he was hungry, they fed him. When he was thirsty, they gave him something to drink. When he was a stranger, they welcomed him. When he was naked, they gave him clothing. They took care of him when he was sick and visited him when he was in prison. These sheep are stumped. They don't understand. Maybe they thought it was on account of their proper worship or correct beliefs or the maintenance of tradition that they believed they would inherit the kingdom. The king shares that whatever they did to the least of these members of the king's family, they did to him. Likewise, the goats are sent to the accursed eternal fire because they did not feed, welcome, visit, or tend to the least of these. One can see how motivational these kinds of stories would be uh, for those struggling to stay faithful during challenging times. Promises of blessedness and threats of being accursed, especially those in this story, have been effective in trying to get people to behave and believe in the proper manner, lest they fall away and face the flames. This story, however, wants to do more than that, it gifts us with a way of seeing the world and a different way to understand God. This parable reveals that God is not experienced in the worship spaces where creeds are confessed and rituals are performed. God is not some powerful being ready to intervene in miraculous fashion, a strong man projection for us weak mortals who need rescuing. God is not some supernatural sky dweller, an answer to our every unanswered question. If we conceive of God in these ways, if we think we will experience God through these forms, we will miss out on the truth that God is in our midst. God is encountered in the stranger, in in the prisoner, in the hungry, in the sick. God is not to be known as a magical being, but is known in our midst, among the mist and messed up 
the mundane, and the maligned. This parable invites you and me to relocate God from up there or out there to right here. This story challenges us to reimagine God not as the the powerful, supernatural being ready to do what we ask if only we inquire correctly or with enough conviction, but God as weak and in need of our assistance, our protection, our care. This tale opens us up to a new way of understanding other people, that those we consider the least in our societies, those beyond the scope of our considerations, those who are victims of our excesses and successes, are the very presence of God in the world. If we wish to encounter God, we need not look in the sanctuaries of holy places or in the skies above, but we look to our neighbors. Our gospel invokes the name of the devil. The devil is another popular figure in her magical thinking, a trickster who causes evil to happen to us or who wiles us into doing evil ourselves. A Jewish story that gives background to this character, however, gives us a different perspective. I've shared it with you all before. You're probably tired of hearing about it, but maybe you need a refresher. The story goes that when God creates the human beings in God's image, God commands the whole heavenly hosts of angels to bow down and worship the human beings because they're made in the image of God. One angel, though, on account of God's commandments, refuses to do so. Satan. Zealous for God's law, for the commandment to worship God alone, Satan disobeys this command and is ironically cast out of the heavenly realm. Satan now wanders to and fro throughout the earth, trying to discredit these human creatures in the eyes of God, seeking to convince God that they are not worthy of all this affection and adoration. When we focus on orthodox beliefs or right rituals or moral behavior in an effort to obey or please God, it so often is at the expense of humanity. Our need to be right or to keep tradition has us engaged in the satanic, disregarding the image of God in our midst in order to please the magical God out there who requires our worship or can right our lives. This path leads to death and hell. Not honoring humanity enough to take care of them in their need, to welcome the stranger, to feed the hungry, to heal the wounded, to wear a mask, we can add, consigns our neighbors to suffering, to rejection, to illness. When we make God out to be a magical being who exists as the answer to our questions or who exists to serve us or who exists for us to serve, we end up creating a world of pain for our neighbors near and far, and and we will discover, as in the language of the parable, a punishing world, an accursed world. However, when we take care of our neighbors, attend to their needs, call for justice for them, and, and work to make sure that they are included and safe, There, in and through them, God is known. This is not so much magical thinking as mystical, as understanding that in every interaction with another human being, God is there and can be encountered. God is not a magical being or or perhaps a being at all, but something totally other than all that, something or someone outside of all of our religious conceptions. Whatever or whoever God is, God is experienced in human beings whose existence, whose presence is ever and always an invitation into service, into empathy, into what the story calls eternal life, 
life in the new kingdom and creation of God. How would your life change if your neighbors were known as God come near to us? How would our world be transformed if those most in need of our voice or vote or action or ear were attended to with the same zeal that so many reserve for God? How might it make a difference to the future of our world, to our, our pandemic responses, to our congregational life, if we did away with our magical conceptions of things and embraced the mystery of God's existence in and through human beings? Beloved of God, the promised reign of Christ, the day of justice and the fullness of God's presence is here. It is not in the realm of the, the magical, but is as real and as close to you as your neighbor is. God is encountered and eternal life is known in your care for our community during this time, when your life gives way to the needs of others. God is experienced and blessedness is entered into when God no longer haunts some cosmic corner of the universe in our thinking, but is seen in the flesh as every person you meet. The reign of Christ comes near when you come to the aid of people put on crosses or silenced or forgotten. May the gift of God's presence and the promise of Christ's reign find you wherever you are, gift you with a profound adoration for other people, and bring you into a world made new by the knowledge that God is among us and that God's rule of life and justice and peace is as near as your neighbor. Thanks be to God.
At this time, you are invited uh, to set aside an offering to send in the mail or to drop by the mailbox at church. Thank you to all of you who have sent in your pledges for the 2021 year uh, to help us plan for this next year. If you have not yet done so, uh, feel free to, it's all right, there's always some, uh, some ones that are received late, so send those in so that we can continue our planning for the year ahead. We are thankful uh, for the gifts that you share and the generosity that comes to be in our world uh, because of your giving. On this last Sunday of the church year, let us pray to see God's reign in the church, in the world, and with all in need. Responding to each petition with the words, in mercy, receive our prayers. Great God, we praise you for sustaining the church through another year of grace. Continue to shepherd your people with your tender care. Sustain the social ministries of the body of Christ and increase ecumenical sharing of opportunities for ministry. You are the great and holy God. In mercy, receive our prayers. Sustain the world that you have made, the heights of the hills, the seas, and the dry land. Guard the animals during the winter months and direct our use of creation to provide for the needs of all. Be a source of strength and refuge for all weathering severe storms. You are the great and renewing God. In mercy, receive our prayers. Bring peace to every place where conflict rages, that your reign may be honored throughout the world. Be with the people of Armenia, Azerbaijan, Ethiopia, and Hong Kong. Bless the work of the United Nations and of agencies that promote the well-being of all peoples. You are the great and peacemaking God. In mercy, receive our prayers. Bring a peaceful conclusion to the American national elections. Bless all the newly elected officials with a love of concord and a desire for justice. Turn us away from historic prejudices and show us your image in each of our neighbors. You are the great and reconciling God. In mercy, receive our prayers. Visit American homes on Thanksgiving Day. When we are separated from loved ones, embrace us with your care. Keep gathering safe. Even in our reduced celebrations, give us voices to offer thanks to you for your perpetual blessings. You are the great and generous God. In mercy, receive our prayers. We beg you to end the Earth's pandemic. Bring healing to the millions who are suffering from the coronavirus, any who are sick, dying, despairing, isolated, unemployed, and all exhausted medical workers. Guide researchers in developing a vaccine. You are the great and healing God. In mercy, receive our prayers. Show your loving power to all who are in need. Equip us to feed the hungry, to provide clean water for the thirsty, to welcome the stranger, to clothe the naked, to care for the sick, to visit the prisoners. This day, we pray especially for Sue, Patty, Annette, Helene, Roger, Bev, Philip, Sonny, Matt, John, Anya, Carrie, Jamie, Anne, Clyde, Carmen, and others that we name before you now. You are the great and gracious God. In mercy, receive our prayers. We praise you for all the saints who have died in the faith, especially this week for the hymn writer Isaac Watts, who gave us words to praise the reign of Christ. At the end of all things, bring us together with all the saints into your kingdom of joy. You are the great and eternal God. In mercy, receive our prayers. Receive our prayers, O triune God, Father of glory, Lord Jesus Christ, and Spirit of wisdom, now and forever. Amen. We pray together the prayer that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. May the God of all creation, in whose image we are made, who claims us and calls us beloved, who strengthens us for service, 
give you reason to rejoice and be glad. The blessing of God, sovereign Savior and Spirit, be with you today and always. Amen. Beloved of God, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.